Hey everybody, you are listening to the eighth episode in the Class of HC 2016 Election Clapback Podcast. This series was inspired by a good book that I read this summer, and it was provoked by a lot of the foolishness that we have all seen in this year's presidential campaign. I am Deji, curator of the Class of Hope and Change documentary. You can find out more information about that project at classofhc.com. Last time we talked about a time when America kind of wasn't so great, the mid to late 1970s. This time we're going to look at a time when America was high on great, the 1980s. If you're listening to this Election Clapback podcast for the first time, thanks for checking us out. Like I said, this was inspired by a good book that I read this summer called Economics, spelled E-C-O-N-O-M-I-X by Michael Goodwin and Dan Burr. Their book was like a comic book version of American history that focused on the economy and does a really good job of telling the story about kind of how we got to where we are in terms of our economics and also does a really good job of telling a lot of the historical events in a new kind of format using comics. I don't know the authors personally, I'm not getting paid to plug their book, but the book was the inspiration for this podcast, and I always believe in giving credit to where it's due. So if you're interested in checking out the book Economics, definitely check out the link in the bio, and you can take a look at that book and see if you want to get it. So we pick up in this episode in the part of the book that deals with the 1980s. In 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president. Ronald Reagan believed and campaigned on the fact that government had gotten too big for its own good and needed to be made much smaller. You can go back to the past episodes that we've done, specifically episodes four, five, six, and seven, that talked about all the stuff the federal government in particular did to try to make life better for Americans during the early part of the 20th century and the mid part of the 20th century as well. So Ronald Reagan thought government was too big told Americans, promised them that they would make government smaller and get government off their back. A couple things Reagan did that the book highlights that you should pay attention to. The book goes into much more detail on these things. I'm just picking up on a few things that I think are noteworthy. First, he cut the income tax rate tremendously for folks who earned the most in this country. So when he took office in 1981, the highest tax rate you could pay on income that you made was 70%. So the richest people, not necessarily the wealthiest, but the folks who had the most income in a given year could pay up to 70% of that to the federal government in income tax. So by the time 1986 rolls around and he's just about done with his tenure, that rate was all the way down to 29% was the highest rate for the wealthiest or the people who made the most money during a given year in terms of income. He also cut taxes for corporations, which Many big corporations liked it, uh, let them save a lot of money on taxes. So that was one part of his promise. One way to make government smaller, if you thought it was too big, was to cut the amount of money government could spend. And you cut the amount of money government can spend by cutting the amount of money government takes in. That's why people lower taxes. One of the reasons, anyway. So he does that. On the other hand, he spent much more money on the military than the U.S. had been spending in the previous decade. So the government had less money coming in. And then the spending on the military went up. And so you can kind of see that there were some trade-offs and how do we make up the difference was the question. And so one of the tools Reagan used was to borrow that money to make up the difference in terms of all the less money government was taking in and all the more money they had to spend on the military. Under Reagan, the U.S. government issued much more bonds. So when the government borrows money, that means they're usually issuing what we call bonds. They're basically IOUs that the government issues and banks buy them, investment companies buy them, foreign countries buy them, individual people can buy them. And so the government issues a bond for whatever, 10,000, 100,000, much more, but any amount of money doesn't really matter. So they issue a bond for, let's say, $10,000. And what that means is if you buy the bond for $10,000, they promise to pay you interest on a regular basis. And then they also promise that you'd get your $10,000 back at some point in the future. So that's how the government borrows money. So a lot of that was going on during the 1980s. But for me, some of the most powerful pages in the book that dealt with the 1980s really talked about the rise of investment banks, which is what we refer to as Wall Street, and how investment banks used borrowed money. So the government was borrowing money to pay for the military. In the 1980s, we saw an increase in investment banks using borrowed money to buy stocks. So again, keep in mind, as this election clapback series is designed to try to provoke questions that we all have to be thinking about, 
So when you think about people who have become wealthy in the past, it, this is not a knock on however anybody became wealthy, but know that a lot of what happens in terms of how wealth gets created in America has to do with borrowing money. So the ability to borrow money and go back to episode one, we talked about capitalism and the free market and the role of banks. The ability to borrow money in America is critical. So much of the wealth and how this country runs is based on borrowing money. So sometimes people, particularly working people who aren't necessarily thinking about the financial markets every day, come to believe that like wealth is only from, you know, you sold more, I don't know, shoes or whatever, um, cars and someone else. But a lot of wealth in America gets created because someone was able to borrow money from someone else and either invest it or take a bet in terms of the stock market or do something with it. And then that's what made them money. But they would not have been able to do it initially had they not been able to borrow money. So always important to think about that. So the book talks about how a lot of investment banks and investment companies were borrowing money to buy stocks. And so as we talked about, check out episode two if you want to find out a little bit more about the history of corporations and kind of what corporations are and how they function a little bit, at least from a historical point of view. So the book does a good job of telling the story how In the 1980s, we see an increase in the number of investment banks borrowing money and then the amount of money that they're borrowing. And many of them are using that borrowed money to buy stocks of other companies. So if you buy enough stocks of a company, you could end up owning half of the stocks or 51% of the stocks. And if you own 51% of the stocks, you are the majority shareholder. And now you get to make the rules about what happens with the company. So that was happening a lot. And so what would happen is investment company borrows money, buys 51% of the stocks in a certain business, often a struggling business whose stock price was low. So that made buying 51% easy. Then they control the company and they sell all the company's assets. So that could be equipment, that could be real estate, that could be land, that could be inventory, depending on what they did. It could be all sorts of things. So they sell the company's assets. Then with that money that they made from selling like real estate and equipment and all this stuff, then they pay back the loan because remember they borrowed the money. And then the difference they got to keep works out for everyone except for the business that got bought out. And now all the people who used to work there are now without a job. They don't really have a place to work because the thing that they were working at doesn't exist anymore because all the stuff that they made got sold. So this is happening a lot during the 80s, or at least a lot more. The book goes into talking about some of the side effects of this behavior. But one of them was that in the 80s now, there became a much bigger focus in terms of economics and how large businesses especially ran on the stock price. So the primary goal of businesses became to get their stock price up. One reason is because, again, with all this money that investment firms are able to borrow in the Reagan years, then there's more money to put into the stock market because it wasn't just their money. They could also borrow money. So now the stock market becomes much more important because more money is involved in it. One. Two, companies start seeing that, hey, that company got bought out. These people were able to buy 50% of the shares. They could do that because the shares were really cheap. So we have to do things to get our stock price up in hopes that the investment companies that like to do this would find our company too expensive to try to buy half the shares. So you have companies trying to raise their stock price. You have stock prices being raised because more people are putting money into the stock market. And so the focus about whether a business is good, whether or not a company is doing good business or not, becomes whether or not the stock price of that company is going up. That's a relatively recent concept. We take it for granted today, those of you who are familiar with kind of how financial markets work and you follow the stock market or you follow business news at all, you take for granted that like we focus a lot on stock prices and we worry about them and that's how people get paid and all this other stuff. But that's not that old of an idea. We kind of just started doing that in America, at least to the extent that we do now. And so with this new focus on companies raising their stock price, That means that the shift in terms of who was important in American business really became more about the folks who were doing the investing. We call them Wall Street as a general label, but we're really talking about investment banks, investment firms, private equity firms, people who've organized their money together in some form. So the focus becomes more on them and on the CEOs of the companies who get paid the most when the stock price goes up. And the focus starts to shift away from workers, the local community where the company is, And in some cases, on whether or not the customers are being best served by whatever the company's doing, right? The focus really just shifts to, is your stock price going up? And so in the 1980s, there was a big stock market boom. 
The 1980s, America is flush with cash. Riding high on the boon of Reaganomics, displays of wealth are all too conspicuous. And the market is a raging bull. It was an incredible market. We didn't, you have to remember as traders, we couldn't care less why there was a bull run. I mean, you know, the, the Cubs were in the 84 playoffs. There was, you know, the, the city was up for grabs. We were all young. We were the house. We were the casino. Public orders would come in. Uh, they would sell to our bids. They would buy from our offers. And we made money from, uh, you know, the space in between. Uh, money making hand over fist. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Wall Street's Gordon Gecko based on maverick icon Ivan Bosky, harnessed the power of computers to become the most successful trader of the day. On August 25th, 1987, the Dow Jones Industrial Average reached its peak of 2722. Taxes were low, inflation rate was declining. Contrarians stated the market was overdue for a correction Ah, uh, yes. Remember, back in episode 5, we talked about how in the 1920s, a similar situation happened where we had a hyped-up stock market. People felt good about the economy. There was money around for some Americans. And that ended in a stock market crash in 1929. And a similar thing happened again in 1987. Something, something's not right. It just didn't feel right. 15 minutes before the opening bell on Monday, October 19th, the New York Stock Exchange is bombarded with sell orders. We came in and we were absolutely convinced they were going down. $500 million worth of stocks are sold instantaneously. So on Monday, I come in flat. I have no positions and the world is in chaos. If you can't buy five units are trading, six units and seven units are trading, eight units are trading here, JP with Merrill Lynch coming in by side, all the way up from 95 up to the figure of five. Stocks open 10% lower than Friday's close. Everybody wanted to sell. So that meant some well-known companies couldn't even open for trading for hours. Exxon, the world's biggest oil company, didn't begin trading for nearly two hours after the stock exchange opened. IBM was an hour and 15 minutes late. Shares of Walt Disney couldn't even begin trading until 11, 12 a.m. It all hinged on New York Stock Exchange. The seven-hour massacre ends with the Dow finishing down an inconceivable 508 points, five times greater than the record set on the previous Friday. To the end, market analysts are steadfastly refusing to even mention that word crash to describe what's going on right now. Instead, they like to look at it as a correction that still has to work itself out. The market loses 22.6% of its value in one day, twice the percentage than any previous day in history, including the crash of 1929, the day that prompted the Great Depression. Once the bell rang at 4 o'clock, they couldn't get out. Uh, the backlog was really basically people like yourself, individual investors, who said, gee, I put in an order at 3 o'clock to sell this stock. Did I sell my stock? I haven't gotten a report yet. I want to know how I stand. I remember at the end of the day, I sat down in the pit. My legs were shaking. I'm sweating profusely, and I'm freaking out at, when am I going to have a job the next day? Are these trades going to clear up? Is this going to cost me anything financially? Is, is this business over with? Is the world coming to an end? I saw two grown men leave the pit crying, literally in tears. They had, knew they had lost everything at that point. Big rumors about what's going on. The government's going broke. The, you know, we're about to experience another depression. I mean, really, it was crazy. I've never seen the panic level like I saw it that day. It's one of those days where, you know, you know, it's like somebody said, what days you remember? My mom said, you know, Kennedy, when he was going mean, to go through the list, and I know my list, and I was a little young when Kennedy was killed, so I don't remember that one. Uh, but this is one, you know, for sure. One of the things that really sticks in my head at, after the close on Monday was, you know, a lot of the guys were holding their heads on the stairs, but one of the guys I, I knew, because he stood there for a while, he was actually crying. 
You know, he lost everything. When the bloodbath is over, over $500 billion of capital vanishes in a single day. And even for many people who were not directly in the financial industry, America was great again. As the upper class thrived under President Reagan's economics, the world began to take notice of yuppies, young, well-educated professionals with a penchant to spend and an obsession with image. I always use an aftershave lotion with little or no alcohol because alcohol dries your face out and makes you look older. Inspired by moguls like Donald Trump, yuppies bought only the finest brands, drove imported automobiles, worked out endlessly, and invested in copious amounts of cocaine, at least according to the stereotype. They don't have a good bathroom to do cocaine. The 1987 Wall Street crash killed the romanticism of the yuppie. The stock market wasn't the only high that came crashing down in America during the late 1980s. It happens frequently, and it happened again last night. A cocaine arrest, this one at Miami International Airport. A Canadian accused of trying to smuggle three pounds of cocaine into this country in three pairs of platform shoes. Its estimated value on the street, $700,000. Authorities say there's an avalanche of cocaine crossing our borders, and in an earlier report, we looked at the controversy surrounding its use. Tonight, Steve Young considers the pros and cons of legalizing the drug. Just one month before the tall ship Gloria from Columbia, South America, graced New York Harbor during the Opsail Bicentennial celebration, she was stopped and 13 pounds of cocaine were found on board. Although that stash was worth about $3 million, it amounted to just a trickle of the total cocaine smuggled into the U.S. by one estimate, a ton a week. Most cocaine comes from South America, frequently hidden in ingenious ways. For example, tucked inside chocolate bars or diluted in bottles of sherry. Seizures have risen steadily. Criminal organizations responsible for smuggling into the United States cocaine are big criminals. Don't fool yourself. They recruit fast jet planes, tankers that come up from Colombia. I would say it's a billion dollar business, perhaps more. Although cocaine enters through a massive criminal network, there is virtually no evidence that cocaine users commit crimes to get it, probably because cocaine, unlike heroin, is not physically addictive. The number of people snorting cocaine is rising steadily despite the steep price. About $100 for a gram, enough for several people to get high at one party. A congressional committee reports that students as young as 13 are switching from marijuana to cocaine. It is also increasingly popular with adults, especially among the sheep. Cocaine paraphernalia is selling well right on Madison Avenue. Who is buying this? Everyone. From the secretary to the executive on Madison Avenue. Lawyers, businessmen, old and young. We have customers in the, in the entertainment business, but uh, like I said, most of them are executives. Though some states can impose life sentences for possession, Americans are now using as much cocaine as they did when it was legal 70 years ago. Sigmund Freud was the first celebrated cocaine advocate. After he said cocaine permitted intense physical or mental work without fatigue, the drug was used in all sorts of patent medicines. Even Pope Leo XIII drank a pick-me-up containing cocaine. In America, the Coca-Cola company put small quantities of cocaine in its new soft drink, which was recommended for its medicinal value. People talked about drinking a shot in the arm and continued to flock to the soda fountain long after 1903 when the cocaine was removed. But it remained in many other products, and in 1912, Hollywood depicted America as a nation on a cocaine binge. Health authorities began to worry about the possibility of addiction, and their concerns were fanned by racist fears that cocaine drove blacks into crime, fears given credence even by the New York Times. There was a lot of propaganda to the effect that blacks use a lot of it and that it made blacks particularly dangerous and that uh, well, there was even uh, there were even some statements that it made blacks invulnerable to bullets. In 1914, Congress outlawed cocaine along with narcotic drugs like heroin. Several years later, it officially decreed that cocaine was a narcotic. That was an incorrect classification since doctors have known for 100 years that cocaine is not a narcotic but a stimulant. That misclassification was cited last year in the successful defense of a Boston man, Richard Miller, arrested for cocaine possession. 
In a landmark decision, Roxbury District Court Judge Elwood McKinney dismissed the charges, ruling the Massachusetts drug law violated Miller's constitutional rights since it falsely assumes that cocaine is a narcotic. The judge said it was drug abuse experts like Dr. Norman Zinberg who convinced him that cocaine is not harmful. Uh, the early fears of it is a hard drug, it's a very powerful and very destructive drug, as it's used in this country, have not turned out so far to be so. The scientific evidence which was introduced uh, in the trial uh, does not indicate there'd be any harm if uh, cocaine were decriminalized and if the, the price uh, was low enough so that anybody who wanted to use it. Should the use of cocaine be decriminalized? So watching that clip left me dead in my tracks and I include the link to all of these clips that I'm using if you want to take a look at them they're all powerful documentaries that was from a CBS News documentary called Cocaine Scandals one of the critical things and part of definitely an election clapback set of questions in this country is how do we deal with the difference between how Americans get talked about when they do the same thing So many of us have an understanding of cocaine now that doesn't match anything you just heard. And a large part of the reason for that is because there were certain kinds of Americans, certain groups of Americans using cocaine, as you heard at the time, and propaganda messages being projected about other Americans who were using cocaine at the time. Does that resonate in this moment? Watch how quickly the message can switch when the users do. Steve Young reports on a new kind of cocaine called crack. It's going nationwide, especially among the young, a drug so pure and so strong, it might just as well be called crack of doom. Crack, the most addictive form of cocaine, is now sweeping New York. They may hawk it by using the word crack. They may hawk it by giving signals of some kind, the snapping of the fingers like this, indicating that I got it, or the snapping of an imaginary whip. Compared with powdered cocaine used for sniffing, crack is four times as strong, purified by a process called freebasing. It's sold in solid chunks, two or three rocks in a vial for as little as $20 ready to smoke. You end up staying up three, four days just chasing cracks. Because it's like, bam, you get hit. You know, within five seconds, I would say, after you take it in your lungs, not even, you got that high. A survey released today of 200 callers to the National Cocaine Hotline shows the use of crack increasing quickly. We found that uh, over 28% of them say that they've already been using crack. Most had gotten rapidly addicted, they said, within two to three months after starting to use crack. Half of them were under 25, and not just from the nation's biggest cities, New York, Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago. Callers from smaller places, Iowa City, Mobile, also reported using crack. Free-based cocaine can be made by the user with ether, but as comedian Richard Pryor learned when he was injured, that is dangerous. Now it's available ready-made. I'm sure that there are people who would not otherwise free-based, who somehow learned about this intense high who are experimenting with it, and that's what makes it really dangerous. And ultimately expensive. I went there one evening with like $700 in my pocket, and within an hour and a half, I had based it all away. Some crack is coming from the Caribbean. The rest is made in the United States. Officials are determined to crack down on crack, per dose, the cheapest, most potent, most addictive form of cocaine ever seen in this country. Steve Young, CBS News, New York. Part of that process led to what we now refer to as war on drugs. Feel free to Google that and look up what that has been about. That has also led to sentencing that differed based on people who used cocaine and people who used crack. Sentencing that differed based on people who sold cocaine versus people who sold crack. And a whole host of other things in America that were passed during the 1980s. So clearly there were more things happening in America and in the world than the stock market and the drug game. But I highlight these because the mid to late 1980s are another period where a significant segment of our current population today in 2016 believes that was a great time in America. There are a significant segment of people who appear on our news television channels who tell us that life was great under Ronald Reagan's presidency and that we should be looking for another leader like him. Now, this is not a space to evaluate Reagan's tenure. I'm not really interested in doing that in this election clapback series. And I'm less interested 
in him and more interested in the people who carry his story and the story about this period in American history to the rest of us. So whichever party you affiliate with and however you want to identify in terms of where you stand politically, one question you should always ask yourself and force the people who talk to you and tell you stories about what America was like, particularly those who tell you that we need another president like so-and-so, is to ask what is it about that president that we would need today? What is the quality? What was it about that time that you thought was great? And again, great for who? Let's continue. I remember looking in the window of Star Pharmacy, and there were these little Polaroid photographs that this young man had made of himself. There were at least three, maybe four of them. The first one was like this. And inside, these big purple splotches. I've been around for the entire epidemic. The only thing I can liken it to is a war zone, but most of us have never lived in a war zone. But it was, it's, you never knew where the bomb was going to drop. We're forced to deal with this unbelievable circumstance of a community that, in addition to being hated and under attack, is now forced alone to try to figure out how to deal with this extraordinary medical disaster. We are not some network of people who just like to have sex. We are not some ephemeral subculture that comes and dissolves and goes. This is a community that was tested in a way almost no community on earth has ever tested. Weissman was part of the scene in those days and recalls how alone the gay community felt. There was a tremendous amount of homophobia and all of a sudden this epidemic comes that is sexually transmitted and uh, no one came to our defense except our own communities. You talk about discrimination and bigotry. One of the characters in your documentary said that, that some of the people sort of were glad that, that gays were dying. Yeah, I think for many people back in that era, they saw that AIDS was God's punishment on us, and they had no, no interest in helping us, and they saw that, well, who cares if the gay people die? The gay community's own newspapers, including the Bay Area Reporter, filled pages with obituaries. Ed Wolf worked as a volunteer with AIDS patients. There was one issue. They decided to run just all the photos of the people that had died in the last year. It was just page after page after page after page. And I was stunned by how many of them I knew from working on the unit. And I, you know, I, I realized I couldn't, I just couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. Being the flower man, I was thrown into the middle of it because a lot of people would say, Guy, my friend died, and I don't have enough money to buy flowers, and I need some help. Can you help us? They wanted to bury their friends with a lot of dignity and beauty. So you can start to research how President Reagan responded to this outbreak of profound death and suffering among a particular group of Americans. You can also take some time and look up how other groups of Americans responded to this tragedy that affected a particular segment of our population, at least initially. And then we can ask ourselves whose faces, whose names, whose lives fill the news now? Whose misery, whose death, whose suffering is testing a specific group of Americans in a unique way? And what has been the response of the government to the suffering of this particular group of Americans in this moment? What has been the response of we, the American people, to the suffering of this particular group of Americans, these particular groups of Americans in this moment? Has our response today to the faces and the names and the death that we see today has our response been one of pity, one of indifference, one of compassion, 
or one of action. This is Newark, New Jersey, one of America's inner cities. Inner city is a polite name for ghetto, as in black ghetto. Those of us who don't live in the ghetto are brought here usually by television and usually only when there are violent pictures to show. But we have to come here if you want to understand those fearsome statistics about the vanishing black family. Now, a lot of white families are in trouble, too. Single-parent families are twice as common in America today as they were 20 years ago. But for the majority of white children, family still means a mother and a father. This is not true for most black children. For them, things are getting worse. Today, black teenagers have the highest pregnancy rate in the industrial world. And in the black inner city, practically no teenage mother gets married. That's no racist comment. What's happening goes far beyond race. Why then do so many teenage girls get pregnant and have children? Why do so many fathers abandon their families? The answers begin with the people here. They told us what happens to family when mothers are children, fathers don't count, and the street is the strongest school. Raise your hand if you're married. None of you are married. Raise your hand if you would like to be married to your baby's father. One. <laughs> the rest of you who don't plan to get married, why don't you plan to get married? I'd like to know that. You, you already have your child to think about and then a, a whole family to care, to care for. You know, it's, it's a lot of responsibility. And then you don't want the commitments. I wouldn't want no man holding me down because I, I think I can make it as a single parent. But don't you think you might need help in raising that baby from a man? Not really. I didn't have a father. My father wasn't in the home, so, you know, it, it really, male figures are not substantially important in the family. thinking about holding up for no sex, my man. You know, if a girl, you know, she get having a baby, carrying a baby, that's on her. You know, I'm not gonna stop my pleasures because of another woman. What about birth control? What about uh, condom? Uh, girls don't like them things. They don't like them things. They'll you know, tell you to take them things off. They figure that you saying that they filthy or they dirty or something. It's been a startling change in values. 25 years ago, you would not have heard such things said so freely because they were not embraced so widely. The strong family was still the backbone of black America, and three out of four children had both parents at home. That is true no longer. Most black children are now growing up without their fathers. The result is a world turned upside down as children copy what they see and repeat what they learn. LaDawn said she didn't have a father in her home and doesn't think her children need one. She's not unusual. Half the black families today are headed only by a woman. Clorinda said she could make it on her own as a single parent. She has never been married and is raising her daughter without a man's help. She's not unusual. Today, nearly 60% of all black children are born out of wedlock. Timothy said his children are not his responsibility. He has left them to be supported by their mothers and welfare. He's not unusual either. For LaDon and Clorinda and Timothy, and many more like them in cities all over America, the traditional family no longer exists. It has vanished, and something new is taking its place. Single women and the children they're rearing alone are the fastest growing part of the black population. What becomes of the black family in a world where the values are being turned upside down? That was the beginning of a 1986 CBS special entitled The Vanishing Family Crisis in Black America. Again, when I watched this, I was just left speechless. As you hear that, do any themes sound familiar? That was 30 years ago. Is the understanding of black life in America where you live among the people that you talk to? Is it similar to what you just heard in that clip? During the period when this documentary aired or when this program aired in 1986, this was also part of the time when today's millennials were born, many of them. Then as in now, the election clapback question is through whose eyes do we look at other people in our country? 
Everything in these clips, drug addiction, sexually transmitted diseases, families in need, financial highs and lows, all these things were going on 30 years ago during the 80s when America was high on great. All these things were going on when some Americans thought things were great and the U.S. was winning. All these things happened during the tenure of one of our most celebrated presidents. And all these things are still happening today. So my election clapback question to each of you, to the American people at large, is who do you think of when you think about drug addiction? When you think about AIDS? When you think about struggling mothers? When you think about people who've lost their money? Take a second to think about the faces and images that just appeared to you. Where'd those images come from? From where and from whom did you learn who was great in America and who was not? Who paints the picture of life in America for you? How does the picture change when the face of American suffering is different from the one in your head right now? There was a lot in this episode. It's kind of heavy. Not really sorry about that. And of course, there were many more things going on in the country during the 1980s that were not dark and serious and sad. What stories and lessons do you think should be included in our understanding of this period when America was high on great? What voices, what perspectives do you think also need to be included as we think about this period in American history? We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at classofhc at gmail.com. We're also at Class of HC on all the social media outlets, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Please use the hashtag election clapback when you are reaching out to us with your comments. That way we can find them and track them and organize the conversation. So the whole purpose of the election clapback series is to try to get a better context for understanding where we are now by getting a better understanding of where we've been. We're trying to create yet another space for people of goodwill and good sense to try to figure out some things that can actually help the country going forward and get away from spending another month arguing about the foolishness on our television screens. We're looking for people of goodwill and good sense only. Trolls and haters need not apply. If you want to see any of those clips that I included in this podcast in detail, I've included the links. Uh, Some of the documentaries are just incredible, particularly for those of you who were just born during this time. It just phenomenal insights and I think will again raise a lot of questions for you that will be relevant in this moment thanks for listening have a great one